The views and opinions expressed in these radio programs are those of the individual hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of Universal Broadcasting Network. You're listening to The Dr. D Show about neuropsychology and well-being. Get the knowledge you must have to live a powerful, positive life. The Dr. D Show, here for you. Welcome to the Dr. D Show today. We are very excited to talk about a topic that's uh, very much of importance, and we're going to introduce it shortly. First, just as a reminder, this is a psychoeducational show. It is not meant to provide you with prof- professional mental health uh, advice or therapy. So if you do suffer from a particular problem, please do reach out to professional help. With that in mind, some of the topics that we cover are not appropriate for the younger population. So if you have little people listening, please use your discretion. And with that, please, I would like to welcome our interviewee today. Welcome. (laughs) Thank you. Would you introduce a little bit about yourself and what you do? Okay. I am Farhan Dozier. I'm a retired Sergeant First Class United States Army, and I'm a sickle cell trait prevention advocate. And will you tell us briefly how many years you've served? I served 24 years total. It's United unbelievable. States Army. Yes, thank you. Unbelievable. Well, first of all, before anything, then we have so much to talk about today, so it's really yes. exciting. <laughs> um, and it's it's very important. I'm v- I I really feel that this is going this is going to be a beginning of something very important. Definitely. Um, uh, for me in this area and and a continuation um, for your amazing work. Uh, but first, I would like to thank you for your service to our country. Thank now you. more than ever, we know uh, the situations that we're facing, and um, there's never a shortage, unfortunately, of a need yes. um, for brave people in our country to do the work, and this work has to be done. Has to. And so, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, and for our, our listeners today, we are talking about today. The subject of today's awareness for uh, sickle cell anemia and sickle cell trait uh, I- in the and what the population. Uh, and individuals who suffer from these conditions go through. Uh, We're going to really kind of assume that we're all new uh, to this information in one way or the other. I will bring in uh, neuropsychological um, findings that we know in this area and what it looks like for on our end in neuropsychology. Uh, But what's important is always to bring it home and what individuals that actually go through um, the, the conditions have to deal with because this is a chronic condition. Um, let's go ahead, uh, f- Fran, tell us a little bit more about the, about the condition. About the condition. So it's a inherited gene, sickle cell trait. Mm-hmm. Um, a person with sickle cell trait inherits one copy from one of the parents, the mom or the dad. Um, sickle cell disease is where the child inherits two copies of the gene from, the, f- from both parents. Um, sickle cell trait inherited, um, like I said, from Africa is where it, it um, came from. Uh, it was a, has a purpose. It fights malaria. So in that population during um, back in the, the times uh, when the malaria would infect a person, a person would survive if they had sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease. So in that part of the country, it, it served a purpose. Out of that environment uh, here in the United States, it seems to be more of a, a disparity or a problem um, in our in our community. Here. And anemia in general, um, there is a sensitivity to anemia where it presents more also in the Middle East in yes. general. Um, and that's one of the reasons is it's really a protective mechanism for the body. But when you change the environment for individuals, um, uh, historically, that's just what we do. Yes. Um, our bodies have to adjust and not always they're capable to do that in one or two generations. And that's one of the things I'm out to, to disappear is that it's not just an African-American issue. Mm-hmm. It's a global issue. Like you said, Mediterranean, European, Greek, um, Asian, Caucasian. Because you have to know where your bloodline is from is where you determine if you carry that gene in your in your body. And so Hispanics, number two, mm-hmm. we're number one. We're one in 12, um, but Hispanics are between one and t- uh, 1,200 mm-hmm. carry the, the sickle cell trait, and one out of 36,000 actually carry the disease. Mm-hmm. And so I've met people with sickle cell disease with um, hi- that are Hispanic, and a lot of them don't acknowledge that that's what that is. So... Well, I'll tell you, my grandfather comes from uh, Yemen, so a part of my origin is also Yemen, and he uh, passed away at the age of 72 from anemia. Ah. And the there was such lack of knowledge back then on what he was going through and how to deal with it, and really there was just no way 
um, back then that they knew of to prevent right. the deterioration that he was going through. Um, and it took us years to figure out what was going on really and then really be proactive about it and get the family members tested and see where we're standing. Right. Uh, but absolutely, this is we find it a lot in the Middle East. Um, we also find it with other sensitivities, and I won't go too into that too much uh, today, but um, there, there's other physiological issues that happens with nutrition and other things yes. where... Um, if you come from a particular origin, for example, with Yemen, uh, Yemen and Middle Eastern, um, high sensitivity to sugars, even above and beyond uh, uh, white, you know, more white Caucasian European right. descendant people. And so um, the effect that it would have on our body is a lot more detrimental. So right. I'm cognizant on that and have very little sugar in my <laughs> diet, um, hardly at all. <laughs> Um, but it's but it's I watch it for my children as well, and yes. I think that's we're going to talk a little bit later oh, on definitely. about being diet proactive. Is, yes, diet is very important. And mm -hmm. if I could mention about sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease, um, there are other genes that, when come in contact with sickle cell trait, form a, a form of sickle cell disease. So you could have sickle cell trait, and your mate can have thalassemia trait. And mm -hmm. if you're not aware that you carry these two genes, your child could be born because you can pass the S and they pass the thalassemia, the child has sickle cell thalassemia. So our community is combined with different gene types because you may have a person with sickle cell SC mm -hmm. or sickle cell thalassemia or sickle cell SD, sickle cell SD. There's so many you know, variations of red blood cell conditions. Mm -hmm. So my, 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 my voice is to find out what's in your genes so to be able to create a conversation about you talking to your mate like, hey, you know, not just let's go out to dinner, but, you know, have yeah. a serious conversation. And most of us don't really have those type of conversations. Absolutely. This is a, a, an excellent point you're mentioning. You know, you know, in Israel, in the last 20 years, they are testing. They're, they're actually promoting and advocating for couples that are dating to test themselves to do the full genetic makeup. Yes. Because also in a Jewish-European lineage, for mm -hmm. example, they, car they carry over 40 major diseases where babies die very early. Yes. There's very, uh, certain conditions. And just by preventing from the next generation to have to suffer, and you as a parent have to deal with with you know with that. I think it's it's a it's a great proactive way. Um, but you know you don't find that in colleges here. You don't <laughs> find that in right. like who talks about these things. You don't. They, they, and you know I always laugh and say. What are we doing teaching them how to actually do the act? Like that's <laughs> seriously now you can actually watch you can actually watch that on TV, you exactly. can figure it out. I mean you put somebody in a jungle don't know what to do, right? It's like a no brainer there. But why aren't we teaching them the things that To be responsible. To be responsible, to be knowledgeable, to be proactive, to know what to look at life at a span of time and yes. not look at it at a moment. And I, I always feel like how weird it is that we're <laughs> teaching them the thing they're gonna know anyways. Um so yeah. yeah, but it's but I agree with that. Let's go back a little bit to um, what it actually means in terms of the effect o on the body, what happens to our cells? So what happens, um, a person with, I'll just say it my, myself, I carry one copy of the gene, the sickle cell trait. Um, I had an experience called sickle cell trait exertion where one my one copy of the S gene actually mutated mm -hmm. and I lost, come to find out, 40% of oxygen in my body, wow. which triggered other um, injuries uh, called rhabdomyolysis, mm -hmm. uh, renal failure, um, vertigo. I had a lot of issues because of that gene mutating. So with a person with sickle cell disease, when both of those, they carry two copies of the gene. So when both of those mm -hmm. genes mutate, you're talking about a, like a 405 traffic jam. Literally, wow. when the blows, when, when, the mut when the red blood cells mutate, they become stiff and sticky. And to, to circulate through the, the blood veins and the, and the calip, Calipers, it's, it's they get clogged, and so mm -hmm. wherever they clog at is where the pain is because there's no oxygen getting to that p part of the body. So mm -hmm. it could be the hands, the feet, the um, organs. Mm -hmm. it could, wherever blood flows, they can have a, a crisis. And, uh, you know, y th there's just so much to deal with. Yes. Okay, at the same time. Really what it does, so, so let's think about our body for a second. We're talking about a physiological situation where you've got pain in various areas in the body. And it's it could be a sudden pain. It could be something that gradually increases. Uh, and and it, it takes a while. And it could be various amount of time before that pain goes away. So now you're dealing with pain. But let's add to that the factor that what we're really saying is that oxygen is not getting to the cells exactly. properly. At the end of the day, not, not only that it causes pain, but you need oxygen for the rest of your body to function. So that can ultimately create fatigue. Yes. It creates uh, uh, 
uh, think that's the number one symptom um, okay. in people with sickle cell trait and disease is the perception of you're lazy. Mm-hmm. But actuality is that you're fatigued because of your oxygen in your body and you're tired and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you're not able to have the energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's one of the... And issues. that fatigue can be translated in psychological assessment and particularly in neuropsychological assessment. So I will tell you that in my area, uh, when we're testing uh, a child or an adult who is suffering uh, from sickle cell or um, it could be other conditions that relate to loss of oxygen or a dep- deprivation of um, oxygen to the cells, uh, for example, severe apnea and so forth, yes. um, that creates a asthma. slowness, asthma, asthma is right, is severe asthma, anything where any condition that ultimately um, uh, disrupts the uh, necessary, the most detrimental process of oxygen getting to the cells, um, it can create um, slowing down of reaction time on psychological and cognitive testing. So let's not just think about the testing that we're doing, but definitely in those testing, there's something we call processing speed. So the, if you are, if your processing speed is now slower, it is affected because it takes a long time for your body to go ahead and create the reaction that's needed or for your brain to respond to the task at hand, it's going to affect the result that you have in the testing and it's going to affect other results that you have in academic and learning environment. Yes. And that's a point that, that I would like to really share with you, if nothing else today, because this is how it affects children from a very young age and they're not able to say that to you because they're not cognizant of what it means they don't have the words for it they cannot describe it to you this is just something that's happening to them as they're trying to figure it out so it is our responsibility for teachers for professionals to identify the uh, not only identify these children that that are struggling with that even by the way if they don't uh, show neurological problems Mm -hmm. it's very interesting in neuropsychology what we found out there's more tiny, tiny uh, uh, multi-infarcts in the brain, uh, little strokes, tiny little strokes, and and little little areas where we'll have bleeding, we call it hemorrhaging, in the brain. You're not going to detect that necessarily in brain imaging. Mm -hmm. Our technology is not advanced enough. Um, And yet if if the child or the adult is suffering with that, it will have an effect on their functioning in various ways. I have a lot of community when I interview that they have had silent strokes at seven years old. And the parents, like you say, have no idea because you, you can't see that in, until it's a severe stroke. And then it's when they are able to determine, you know, that the child is having a stroke. Absolutely. A and, and it can happen not just, um, it ha- can happen at nighttime, by the way. It's another thing. And you see that also with the older population, which is not what we're talking about today. But um, mini strokes or transient ischemic attacks happen also during the night and you can have two three five sometimes 15 in one night and you don't know the person wakes up in the morning right. and you, d- you have no idea what they just went through exactly. they just went through a brain tr- a brain accident or trauma so uh, this these are the things that parents need to know and teachers need to know um, and assessors because um, it, it will affect the functioning and if we don't touch on that let's talk a little bit about what happens to the youth Hmm. Or, or even before we go to youth, let's let's stay with kids first and kind of like progress with time. And, and it's good to look at it at a span of time because I think exactly. there's different stages. Yes. Um, but for one, maybe you can share with us what are the potential implications when a child is struggling with all of these physio- physiological um, impediments? What what is happening? You know, well, from interviewing my community, uh, I get so many different stories um, on how when they're at that age, the the mental stress of I can't focus or, you know, the, the friends don't, aren't the, the, the friendship relationship type of things. I mean, it, it starts to weigh on their mind even at four or five. We don't, like, we don't think that the little kids are comprehending what's going on, but they are. It's just, like you say, they're unable to maybe speak it. Mm-hmm. But once they have gotten older, when they look back and they tell me, yeah, at f- you know, five, six years old, man, I was, I was mentally depressed because... You know, I, I, I couldn't focus or I was learning slow. And then all those reactions that go with you give the wrong answer in the classroom and now you, they laugh at you and now you make a decision and now you're not going to speak anymore. And mm-hmm. it just singles them out. And it's like I said, the mental aspect of it, um, being depressed myself two and a half years is a very important uh, conversation that's that's not being had in that community. And uh, and not 
it's not being brought forward to the attention of the adults that are operating with the children. So our responsibility as either parents or teachers uh, is to be the support system for these children and yeah. identify the moments when the child is struggling. Exactly. Uh, we need to see it. You know, it's one of those things and then address it as it happens. Uh, in, in neuropsychological testing, we, uh, the few studies that have been done do show um, that there are differences, significant differences in performance between children who have sickle cell um, and children who don't. And uh, the differences are in actually multiple areas on the brain that are in charge of many things. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the executive functioning. We're talking about the area of the brain in the front of the brain. That's I always call the CEO, <laughs> but you know, it's in charge of everything. Um, we have issues there. Mm -hmm. We have concentration, yeah. attention, slowness of reaction. We talked about the processing speed being yeah. affected, memory. You know, yes. it w and and it just by the fact that your attention and concentration is not good, how are you going to actually exactly. memorize the you information exactly. if you're too busy? Right. If you're too busy with everything else, that's going to you're struggling just to focus. Right. You're struggling to deal with the fatigue. Maybe you're struggling to deal with pain. And now let's add to that the component of depression. Right. And so you want me to learn. Right. <laughs> After all of these things I'm dealing with right now, I'm just trying to manage all of this and I'm only three years old. Yes. And now you're telling me I need to pay attention. Yes. So not seeing the whole picture is a problem. Definitely. You know, we have to we have to notice that. Um, and dealing with the depression, let's let's touch a little bit on that. That's, <laughs> that's a hard one. I know that's. Yeah. <laughs> for, for me, you know, Serving in the military, I had I had a great I had a I had a great career, and I knew that my stress level when I got to that point, I would go to the basketball court, play a few games, four or five hours, and I would leave it on the court, mm -hmm. and that's how I would die, you know, you know, let my stress out. Mm -hmm. um, and at the point where I had my sickle cell trait um, exertion injury was 2006. Um, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I was doing the Army physical fitness test. Um, I was working on my master sergeant rank up at Camp Roberts, California. And a normal morning, I did my push-ups, I did my sit-ups, and then I started the two-mile run. And, you know, we're trained when we're running. You know, I'm talking to myself, and I, I, I come around, it's my last lap. So I'm, I'm running, and I'm running, I'm looking around, I see all the other, my classmates running. And so I come around that last stretch, and that's where we're trained to sprint that last, that last stretch. So I could hear my instructor with the clock. 1545, 1546, and I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. So I, I kick in that second gear, and as I sprinted, uh, you know, to take off, I, I felt like a warm sensation. Wow. And yeah. I was like, mm -hmm. ah, that's weird, but, you know, it's 630 right. in the morning. I got this breeze hitting me, but I got this, this surge mm -hmm. of warm energy hit me, and I come across the finish line 16 minutes. I put my hands over my head to get air in my lungs, and so I, I start to walk around, and then I just noticed it just started getting dark. Wow. And I could see like my peripheral, it just started getting dark. And I'm like, man, I don't, I don't feel well. Yeah. And so when I kneeled down, um, I closed my eyes because I started to, everything started to spin. So I kneeled down and I just laid back and just closed my eyes real tight. And then when I opened them, everything was spinning like a million miles an hour. And I'm like, man, what's going on? And so they're like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah. Like I knew where I was. Yeah. I didn't pass out, but I knew where I was. This but is I a just scary experience. This is I couldn't open my eyes. Horrifying. So they called the medics, took me down to the, the local hospital. And, you know, I was sitting on the on the bed and the doctor comes in. They had ran some tests and he's like, you ever had kidney problems? I'm mm -hmm. like, no. He says, what do you do now? And he walks out and my instructor's like, what, what is that? And what I'm just like, happened? Yeah, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, and I'm thinking my career is over, right? Mm -hmm. And so he comes back. They give me a couple IVs. Go get some rest. Uh, you should be okay. Just dehydrate it. So I go back to the barracks, uh, go back to sleep, but I wake up and my condition is getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, everything is still spinning around. I tried to drink some water, Gatorade, ate a banana, threw all that up. Yeah. Um, barely made it to the bathroom. I was throwing up and crapping at the same time. I don't know yeah. how I pulled that off. Yeah. But, but that's of severe the, when the you severe. have both happen at the same yeah, time. Yeah, so um, my classmates came back about, f I know class was over at 4.30, so somewhere around 4.30 they came back to the barracks, and I told them I need to go back to the hospital. I'm not feeling well. Yeah. So they rushed me back, and the night doctor ended up keeping me. And he saw that my CPK levels were over 12,000. Wow. So the, what happens with the rhabdomyolysis is that, that once those muscle enzymes break down and get into the bloodstream, they become toxins. Mm -hmm. And because the kidneys can't filter all that toxins, they start to shut down. So my kidneys yeah. were filling at 50% each. Wow. And so all they knew to do was to flush me out with IVs. So I spent four days in the hospital. Yeah, they had to clean up your system. It's right. getting out of the And toxins. at this point, we sickle cell trait was not even 
a thought of a connection right. uh, until four years later when I developed a case of arthritis and I happened to pass one of my officer friends and he was like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, man, you don't even want to know. Right. And he's like, no, tell me, tell me. So I mentioned him what was I was going through. He says, well, he says, well you know, I have sickle cell trait. My muscles locked up on, on me one time from exercising too, but I have sickle cell trait and I got to take vitamins and these things. I'm like, hold on, hold on. Mm-hmm. Sickle cell trait? He's like, yeah. I'm like, hey, I think I have that gene. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. So I went back to LA Air Force Base and I got the physical from 1999. Now, this is 2010. Wow, this is amazing. This is 2010. I go back and I get the physical from 1999 and I had a positive sickle cell trait test. Oh, so wow. when I remembered taking that physical, they called me in a panic and they're like, you need to come back to the clinic. And I'm like, uh oh, like, did right. I party too hard this weekend? <laughs> like, you know, what's going right. on? So they called me back and they set me in the chair and says, do you know you have sickle cell trait? And I'm like, no. Right, but you were young. Yeah, I'm, I was yeah. Uh, I'm 29. You're like, okay, yeah, I have a trait. Yeah, you know? and I have a cousin on my dad's side that has the disease. So I'm yeah. like, well, I know I have a cousin, but I know, you know, and that's about all I know. Sure. But they didn't give me any information. They just said, okay, we just want you to know. But, no. but what does it mean? Yeah, right. and so I, like you say, me? I'm at, my ter- at the prime of my career, in one ear, out the other. I'm already playing ball, you know, sure. four or five hours a day, five days a week. So I'm just, okay, I, I have the trait. That's it. Sure. And so, um. That was 2006, like I said, when I collapsed. And when 2010, when I found out what was going on with my body, um, and this, mind you, I was depressed um, from like November time frame of 2009. So in 2010, mm-hmm. I was in literally in the spiral of my depression. So I was up at, you know, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, sure, wide insane, awake, yeah. because I'm worried about my career. Like, it's over. And I, I like, that was my stability you know, that was my provi- I provide for my family. Your pride. Yeah, and my pride. Now, don't just talk about pride. You talk about pride, identity. Yeah. And so all that was, was out of my control. And so the depression, I literally saw myself in the stages. It's like I watched it on mm-hmm. film. I saw how when I first saw the message come across my computer, when um, it said that I was pending, uh, pending discharge. And so when I read that, I'm like, how am I pending discharge when nobody's talked to me? Like, so I called the uh, state surgeon's office and she explained to me, no, you're not pending discharge. There's a process. So she told me the process, but I had already digested sure. what I saw on the computer. So I emailed back to the officer and told her, can you please change this? Because I'm not pending a medical discharge. So they changed it, but I had already, bought, I already bought that. Yeah, sure. I already bought that. And we process things physically. Because people are a lot, a lot of people are not aware of that. Yes. But notice what happens to your body when you get bad news, and this kind <coughs> of news. And and this is amazing uh, what you're sharing with us because part of what has happened and you were going through is really the lack of being able to get that information when you were much younger, yeah. and being able to have a different way of of dealing with it. Now, in a way, you were blessed because you had twenty. Yeah, something years yes. where where you didn't have all of those you know reactions and and your bo- your body reactions and you were able to to have an amazing career and now you're having a different kind of career yes. which I think is is fortuitous and it's it's it it has a goal now and and so now what happened from reading that message on the screen every day that I went to work I was like a zombie mm. I was afraid I was nervous when the phone rang I sure. jumped because now I'm waiting for that call and so I just watched myself disconnect from my friends i didn't want to go watch football no more no more sports i just want to be in my room isolated and isolated and i wake up at like 6 30 in the morning because that's my internal clock but i i wouldn't eat i wouldn't get up and it'd be eight o'clock at night and i haven't sure. done anything and i just noticed and one of my friends like you know what you better make sure you're not getting depressed i'm like depressed nah i'm like my mind I'm, my mind is strong but i was already Inside, in it yeah. i was already in it and so i felt i needed to go to talk to someone so I went to the LA Air Force Base and started talking to a mental health provider. And we would sit a couple of times a week. And it just, like I heard him, and it, it, it lasted enough for me to get back in my car and drive. But as I got back to my home or where I was going, I went back to that thought of, what am I gonna do? Same reality. And then so it went right back. My story came right back. And so um, two and a half years later, um, um, my provider, he went on vacation. He went on leave. And another guy, um, uh, Officer Benjamin, came down as a replacement. So he's, I went in his office, sat down. And he's like, so I read your chart. 
I, I understand you've been we've been coming here for like two and a half years now. So what's going on? He's like, what are you going to do when you retire? I said, well, God blessed me with a sports brand. So I'll probably just sell some T-shirts and sit on dock of the bay, watch the tires roll away. And he was like, you know, let me show you something. So he, he and his colleagues had wrote a book for uh, college students, student athletes. And in the passage, it talked about sickle cell trait exertion. Wow. And so when he when I read it, I'm like, like, you know what I went through? He's like, yeah. He's like, it happens. It's becoming common. And I'm like, so I'm in tears crying. I'm like, well, why aren't they listening to me? Because I'm telling UCLA, UCLA Medical Center. I'm telling the doctors at the base. And they're brushing me off like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. And so he's like, no, nah, it's, it's a problem. And so he's like, well, you know, you can become an advocate for your, 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 your gene. I'm like, what do you mean advocate? He's like, you can actually become a speaker and educate people about this, about, about your story and then about the gene and what it causes and the conditions and what it, all the impacts. I'm like, really? And like in the middle of that depression, like this light bulb came on mm -hmm. and like I knew exactly what I was going to do. And I went home and I was sick all night researching, creating my information, doing my research, finding that little kids had been collapsing and dying. Professional athletes, Ryan Clark played for the Pittsburgh Steelers during that time in 2007 in Denver, collapsed on the football field, lost his spleen and gallbladder due to sickle cell trait exertion. He can no longer play in Denver. So when I'm finding all this stuff, I'm looking at regular people who are active in the community, doing things, exercising, and they've collapsed and the families had no idea. And then the college students playing football and they're, you know, trying to get to the pros or whatever their whatever their mentality is. And they collapse on the field and the, 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 the athletic department doesn't know what's going on. And then the families don't know. And then when they do the test, sickle cell trait is a trigger. And now the child is gone. So you think those parents want a check from the school or would they want their child back? Right. So my, my thing is, what's the value of life? You know, and there's so many things around the sickle cell trait that is African-American. Yeah, we own that. I'm telling the community, yes, we own it. We're number one. What are we going to do with that? Who are we going to be about that? And these diseases and these gene conditions don't define us. Yeah. That and we can have life. And these are fathers and mothers and children. And uh, we have to be proactive. There's no so other way. You have to be proactive. You have to be aware. You, you have, have to know. You have to know. And, and I... Uh, you know, you talked about the light bulb, but I think we all we all have these moments. We all have to have them. Yes. Uh, and I, I'm glad that, you know, we all, I, I believe in, some people can call it karma, you can call it spirituality, you can call it God, whatever Purpose. works for you. But we are messengers to each other. Yes. We always are, and we touch people's lives. And that person that came to you and gave you the information oh and opened that door for you to have, you know, now we're closing one door, but we're going to open yes. another. And we go through stages in life. And what has happened to you and that you survived through that and you're taking that strength, that military strength, yes. the discipline, the passion. And there is a lot of that. I work with veterans every day. <laughs> I know how it is. Yes. And that beautiful passion, you take it now and you bring it to a purpose that is is changing people's lives yes and every day and and i think this we gotta hold hold on to it because uh they're gonna be hard days yes you know they're it's gonna be hard it's days. it's when he when he told me that I, like i said i went home i did my research you know I, I my my sister was in college she helped me put my story together with some powerful words you know so i did my story but also i started doing more research and that's you know social media you know then was pretty big facebook and so I found some sickle cell support groups. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I found that the SCDA was having their conference. So I put together my brochure, packed up my bags, and I flew to the conference. And, and they people were like, who are you? Like, who are you? And I'm talking about sickle cell trait exertion, my sickle cell trait. And that's more of a disease organization. So, it, you know, I, I kind of felt out of place, to be honest, because, you know, in, in this conversation, um, as I'm discovering, sickle cell trait had a one little piece of paragraph make sure you don't make with another person with the th with the trade sure. and th it is a, there's a little disclosure that they normally they usually live a normal life and the word to me usually means that there's something else that could be possible and sure. so and that's like two or three paragraphs and then you have this whole conversation about the impact and results which is the disease and so most people focus on the disease conversation because it's little just babies mm -hmm. and it's you know children and the pain and the suffering sure. And 
to for me as a prevention advocate, I catch a lot of heat because I focus on the trait, but I also are, am able to talk about the disease because it is one of the results of having sickle cell trait if you mate with a person. So I kind of keep the conversation a little separate from the Send disease. Send the heat my way. Yeah, I'll do I'm going like to, <laughs> but I can take it though. I, I take it though because I, it's but I think it's I what think I do. I, I'm just going to say, you know, there's room and place <laughs> for everything. <laughs> and, you know, we should not fight over the right, population. Exactly. You know, because And, and it is, uh, we're kind of joking about it, but it's a take home point. We need to work together. Yes. There is time to treat the people that have the disease. There is time, uh, really, the trait relates to the disease. You want not only to prevent. Uh, people with the trait mating, but uh, here's a fact of life. They're going to. Some <laughs> of them are not going to know they have the trait. Yes. Not everybody has the money, the knowledge, the access to get genetic testing, and people exactly. fall in love, and young people, you know, our brain is not fully developed at that time. We may just do it. Whatever it is, um, even if it doesn't get to the disease, but it gets to the trait. It gets to the to the fact that somebody can go through the exertion. They can go through that thing where they run a certain kind of life and then suddenly a detrimental effect on their life comes around. We need to deal with that. Even even after I start to discover and meet people with the trait that would talk about, you know, I, I've had pains in my arms and legs and I remember five years old. Now I'm going to go back to 75 to date myself. My, my, right, my left arm would ache as a child and my grandmother would hold me over the sink and run warm water over it and that's the only thing that would wow. s calm that pain that sensation i call it a sensation and so they took me to the doctor they told my my grandparents it's just growing pains he's five he's just growing pains i i live my entire life with that sensation but i just became a part of me sure and so i can remember you know my it's like a sensation it's not like a sleep. It's like a w it's like w weakness and tingling. Yeah, at the same it's like time. and it's like it, I I wish I was a black Ken doll that I could take my arm off and put on the shelf. Is how how bad it hurts, and so realizing that I have the sickle cell trait gene and the re, re, the impacts and the results of the pain, it may not be as this, like a person with the disease, but when I relate to them and we talk, it's that same kind of sensation. So, you know, there's like I said. The people with sickle cell trait, we have to understand that we do carry one copy of the gene, and we know what two copies do, but what is this one copy of gene doing to our bodies, which is causing some, t you know, secondary complication? And in a way, you touched about, you know, what happens um, from childhood to lifetime. When we look at that span of time, we need to think about what kind of changes or things a person needs to incorporate in their life in order to make those type of symptoms yes. less severe. Do you want to touch about that? Yes. Um, s discovering, you know, now looking back um, and doing research, how, m how important diet is, how important the, the sugars, the even I discovered that having sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease eating starches mm -hmm. and how starches actually deplete the the proteins and the oxygen from the bloodstream i mean to, to so if to know about how what the food how it impacts our our daily lives we don't look at that long term we look at oh i'm gonna get some mcdonald's and because it's quick mm -hmm. but not really looking where that i i say now eating to your gene type because when we if that gene is from africa like i said what do they eat over there you know we're right. not eating those foods here we're eating i'm i'm black but i'm eating mexican food or i'm eating lasagna or things or like fast that food. You or fast, fast food fast food right so it could be that the food that i'm eating is actually is not providing the minerals and the nutrients that my body needs especially having a gene condition mm -hmm. i need more water than the average person i need more nutrients and minerals than the average person and if you don't know that your it diet is gonna is gonna deplete those things and the effort you. that you're making are going to have limited effect mm -hmm. so with my uh patients and people that i see i always take them to a checkup to a mm. nutritional checkup yes and then the next thing we do is we review what they're eating <laughs> and we take a look and and uh you know then there's the uh, part where they're not honest yeah, and they yeah, want to yeah, impress course, you and course. then there's the part where they're actually okay fine i'll tell you what i eat burritos uh, you know really last <laughs> night i had this and that and cars jr right and, uh, and you go okay all right let's let's make 
make sense out of it. But but it is true because if you think about your food, it is the fuel for your body. Yes. It is what your body is made of. It is what's going to make it or break it. And people who have sensitivities, like I have a sensitivity for sugar, right. even above and beyond, everyone is suffering from a sugar problem. Exactly. And it's not good for anyone. And by the way, the sugar, hate to destroy it for all of you <laughs> there, but it is the catalyst for cancer, uh, 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 tumors. It exacerbates medical conditions that you have, whatever it is you have, sugar is going to make it worse. It lives on sugar. Exactly. Okay. So, um, but even if you, you know, people like, for example, in my family, for my origin, we have sensitivity to sugar that's even extra. If I eat sugar, I'll start feeling weakness wow. in my arms, in my legs. I will feel this type of fatigue. And you don't have to even have a trait. Or, and, and my genetic exactly. genetics does have a particular Middle Eastern path to it. Right. So I am cognizant of that in my diet we have to teach that to young generation to people of the young generation and start teaching them to enjoy healthy foods yes. see your taste will change when you start changing your eating habits your taste buds change and you, you will start noticing let's say if you ate clean for a few weeks really clean low salt and low sugar and a diet that's homemade um, not processed food and you start trying to eat now restaurant food yeah. or present you will many of us will tell the yes, difference yeah of course you know you'll start getting thirsty you need to drink a lot why do you need to drink a lot it's got a lot of stuff <laughs> in it it's not good for you i'm not that was going to use a bad word <laughs> but <laughs> but it is you know you need it you need it's, it's a ton of remember that what preserves the food is salt and sugar All the msgs the man-made products that that the body does not like you say it, we, it doesn't digest and some of it feeds off of it mm -hmm. so you're figuring if you're eating the McDonald's and the Carl's Jr. not to bash, but that stuff is not breaking down in your stomach. Correct. And that's where all this disease starts to happen, colon cancer and mm -hmm. all this, because it's not being digested. And so I, 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 and I I'm pay attention to my community and I see, you know, drinking soda mm -hmm. and eating, like you said, eating those foods. And I'm like, uh, why do you think you have a crisis? Right. Like if, if you look at what you're eating, your, those are triggers, Correct. not just the weather or you exercising, but your food is going to be a trigger in that crisis and how severe it's going to, how long it's going to last and then how severe it is, I believe. Speaking of that, let's talk about, this is a little bit of a sensitive point, but let's here's go. here's a fact of life. <laughs> that's right, let's <laughs> go for it. I go for those <laughs> points. Um, because it's, that's at the end of the day, that's what's important. Um, one of the main reasons why people eat a lot of fast food with the exception of lack of knowledge, is finance. Yes. Okay, people that, that you know, make a certain kind of income, a low income, uh, you know, or a very modest income and have a few kids to feed, you know, going to spend $2 for a burger is not the same as you're going to, you know, buy a small piece of meat that's going to cost 10 bucks right. and it's good for one person. Exactly. So, so there is a problem. We have to face the problem that there is... Uh, an issue, a financial issue of being able to, of having a difficulty managing um, your budget, the food budget. In fact, what studies show, um, and we know that uh, I used to, um, I graduated with economics, and one of the areas I used to look at uh, for my bachelor's degree is is how much money people spend on their food out of their total income. Mm, yes. And people who make less money sometimes spend 50, 60, 70% of their <coughs> income on food. Yes. And so, ta-da! And <laughs> it's the truth. And uh, so, so when you think about that, how likely is a person, even if you got them motivated and you got them this and that, how likely are they to actually go and buy the healthy foods? If you know, hearing you say that, I still believe that it, it's a mindset. It's still being able to make that choice to, to go to the store versus the convenience of going to the corner and, and going through the drive through I still think it's it's something that still can be taught. Absolutely. How you can... Whether you earn, you know, ten dollars an hour, you can still buy food that can feed you. That's not fast food. I, I, Absolutely. I, think, I think there's it, it's something that just needs to be taught. Absolutely. In fact, um, that's one thing that I work with people on in my own uh, uh, profession. But I'll tell you, even w when people say to me, well, could it be real? Could you actually do it? And I say, you know what? When I was in uh, my educational program when I was earning my PhD. I had three babies during that time in five years. Wow. We lived at my parents-in-law's house at the bottom floor. It was like boot camp. <laughs> you want to talk about Seriously, with the three kids and they're hungry all the time. Anyone who has little kids knows they're hungry all the time. And, you know, 
I had to make a decision, you know, and I could not feed them garbage because I knew too much about this. I could right. not give them bad food. So we started making a plan. And it's absolutely what you were saying, that it's it's a mindset, it's a decision, yeah. and it's an issue of making it an, or, uh, an organized thing for your family. Exactly. Every Sunday or every Saturday, whichever day it is you choose, you're going to go once a week and you're going to buy all the foods, and here's the no excuses <laughs> with the money. P places like Trader Joe's yeah. selling, uh, I know a lot of families that live under Trader Joe's food, and I'm giving them free advertisement. <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> right, Trader Joe's. Come and sponsor <laughs> us, seriously, we need it. No, but it, it's it's true because they sell organic food uh, at a lower cost. You can go to all the markets at our local markets and have those events and make it an experience for your kid. Yes. Like, okay, going to watch um, all these movies with all these blobs and whatever. I don't even know the names right. of those movies. Don't say But them. my kids laugh. They just say, you know, you call it blobs because well, yeah, they are they're blobs yeah. but i say it's it's you know it's it's you, we take them to the movies and that's great and we take them to other things to games and that's great but but this is a thing you can make as a family experience yes. you could take them with you you can start teaching them how to cook too you they can do it with you in the kitchen exactly. like i get my kids to cut the fruits and vegetables and even though it looks kind of funky it's right. fun and you make it an experience and then what they see here's what we know in psychology what they see and what's available is what they're going to eat exactly and here's more what they see and what's available they're going to eat when they're older ah so it's a skill that is learned for life. We know that people who were raised, kids who were raised with good diet habits when they were young, even if when they got older, you know, they had an occasional cake here or the occasional fast food here. Right. In reality, 80, 90% of their diet is, is very similar, if not almost identical to the way they that they grew up. Yeah. So we have to think about these kids that are drinking sodas and eating burgers and everything. Is that what we want our kid to eat when they're older and... You know, is that is that what we want to give them? It really is. It's not the fuel that they need for growth. Exactly. Um, but but this is important. Let's go back to our topic today. Why is that particularly important for individuals with the trait? As far as a uh, diet, the diet. Um, I, like I said, as far as a diet, as far as um, the hydration, you know, like hydration. I said, the quality, the type of food, you know, that provides the minerals. You know, like I said, maybe you may not want to eat. I'm learning that canned foods. Is canned vegetables is not even as healthy as going to the aisle and, and getting the fresh vegetables. So I'm learning myself because I have this, I was going to tell you, I have this mentality of, and I served in the military all these years. When you eat on the military base, like you have your choices. You, you have, have the fast tube. food line, <laughs> fast food line, or you have the, the, yeah. the meal line. And so it's a no brainer. You just give me a vegetable, a starch, a meat, and, and, the sand, and that's your meal. Not for me. I have to reprogram my brain because now I don't I know I don't have to eat that kind of foods. I can actually eat healthier types of food that will give me the same type of energy. Like I have a way that breakfast should look. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to look like pancakes and eggs and sausage and but people are telling me, No, you don't have to have that. You can actually have nuts and these things that will give you the same nutrients. I'm like really right expanding exactly expanding the 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 uh, window of what kind of foods you can eat there is so much out there that can be used as replacement yes um, and see I I, that's my that's where i'm stuck at in life now is like i have a way i have a view of what dinner looks like and so to now try to go outside of that view like you say and now expand to figure out what else can i eat that's going to give me the the nutrients because now i suffer from arthritis mm. so now I, I that was one of my discharges from the military my retirement was the severe p severe depression and arthritis and so now you know my my joints hurt and now i know i need to eat foods sure. that are not going to give me inflammation Correct. you know things like that so i have to reach i have to reprogram my whole entire point of view of of my diet. It's interesting you're saying that because um, the, you know there's various um, situations in life and 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 things you go through with the ages, but particularly now that you're hitting a certain point in time and you talk about inflammation, there are things somebody can do. Like for example, pineapples are anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, you can start incorporating there's either the pineapple itself as it's fresh, which is always best. But if you really suffer from inflammation, you can look into and with your physician's permission. Um, 
powder. There is concentrated pineapple powder oh that wow. is just like an anti-inflammatory. It has a lot of positive effects the same way instead oh wow. of taking a, an actual over-the-counter medication. Right. So that's another option. And, uh, and like you're saying, you when you start looking at food as an experimental thing, yeah. <coughs> you know, I'm going to try different things and see what works for me and I'm going to expand my horizon. Um, you start finding out about spices. There are a lot of spices that are good for the brain. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of spices that can replace salt and make the food taste really good without right. you having to load it up on the salt. Right. Um, there's um, dehydration that you were talking about. You can make various kinds of foods that are water-based. Well, I, I, I started to learn, again, alkaline and, mm -hmm. and having the body, like what they say is, is the body can't, the disease can't survive in an alkaline body, only in an, an acidic body. Mm -hmm. And so learning to have the proper pH level of your body's you know, intake of water and things like that also, the, the alkaline water um, hydrates the cells as well. So Correct. knowing, like I said, knowing now what I know now, you know, it, those are the little changes that I can implement to help to get back to that basketball life. That's my goal is to get back on the court and play ball again and, and, mm -hmm. and live. I don't want to I, I almost let this being a disabled veteran like it almost defined me because I caught myself. Now I'm limited. Mm. But then as I share with my community that same thing of this disease doesn't define you, then I have to look at myself and my disability doesn't define me. Mm -hmm. So I still go to the gym just to smell the sweat on the wall and hear the squeaky floor and make t maybe take a couple of shots. But I'm there and I may play a game or two and I may hurt Correct. that night, but my, my mind is free. And to me, that's most important is to have my mind clear and I can bear the pain. We soldier through that. I soldier through that for 20 mm -hmm. something years. As, you know, we get hurt all the time and they tell you, don't go to sick call. You soldier through that. And unfortunately, sometimes that's bad. <laughs> but it's a different kind of fight. Yeah, it's a different kind of fight. So and but you talked about defining. And I, I think that's another phenomenal point to touch on. Uh, whatever it is we suffer from, we are not our diagnosis. Yeah. We are cannot define ourselves by our diagnosis. And um, wha one of the important things is to see beyond okay, so we suffer from depression or even severe depression or we have a particular disease, but what else is about exactly. us? Exactly. Okay, so that's something that we have. It's something that we're struggling with. It's something we are working on, but there's so much other things about us and about what we want our life to look like. Sh shouts out to my man, Herms. He um, has sickle cell disease, lives in Florida, and he posted um, after the fact that he had t attempted to take his life. He was tired of living with the disease. And when I saw his post, I immediately was like, hey, call me. And so I talked to him and he and I talked and it was it was great to hear how he survived that suicide. But yet he saw that I survived this for a reason. Like God didn't let me go. Like there's something to this. And now he wants to help talk about mental stability, mental toughness, living with sickle cell. And so we encourage, I encourage him, you know, to this day to, you know, find your voice. And what he told me was when he was in the psychiatric ward that he was talking to people there and, he, you know, and sharing, just sharing the conversation. And he, you know, what are your hobbies? And so he started to talk with people about hobbies. And so that's one of the things that you, you mentioned. What else do you like to do? You have the disease. Yes, that's a reality. But then what are your passions? What do you like to do, you know? Some of us, with our spiritual background, we discover what our purpose is. And maybe that, what I share with my community is, when I interview them, is what do you want the world to know about sickle cell? And you have them think about that, then maybe that's your voice. Because in the military, you have privates all the way up to the commander, and every person has a role. They have a job skill. They have a voice. They have what they're trained to do. And so mobilizing the community is my one of my you know things I want to do, accomplish, and by doing that, there's in sickle cell, there's awareness, there's prevention, and then there's education. All three topics are very uh, different, different levels of topics. And so I ask people, what do you want the world to know? Because that could be your voice, and then we can have you expand on that and Correct. how your life experience relates to that topic. And now, now we can see where do you fit in this war on sickle cell because mm -hmm. that's what i'm creating a war on sickle cell and so once they discover that then they discover hey well i i like to to, to make t-shirts or i'm an engineer or a graphics designer then you could actually 
support your awareness like they told me with your graphics mm-hmm. so now you can go on you know get accounts you maybe create websites for people share who you are and now that becomes an income mm-hmm. versus sitting at home like my life is over and what am i going to do which is how i was um so having those conversations that the disease doesn't define you that your disabilities don't define you mm-hmm. and then discovering your voice and what you're living with can shift your whole thought process mm-hmm. and then now you're living with this disease or disorder or condition but you're also making a difference at the same time and you're doing your hobby you know my I never thought I'd be on the radio and and it's just I started it started with the sports show and when I saw that everything shifted to my awareness then that's where I saw well this platform can be used to share stories absolutely and and it just for you know I on blog talk for four years and I sh- I made time for the awareness incorporated with the sports, and to this day I still do that show. And, and you know, this is um, y- you're talking about passion, but even even in my field, okay, um, th- I'm the first neuropsychologist ever to go on radio That's deep. and do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I I in a way, even though you know we have all this knowledge and we have all this work, um, I also didn't know how it's gonna fly. Yeah. You know, and but I had that passion, like you're saying, you have a passion, you have a hobby, you have a dream. You take all of that and you take your talent and resources yes. and you march with it. And there's nothing more powerful than the passion and the want of a human being. Yes. And, you know, everything else, you can you can endure a lot of other things when you work for the cause of a betterment of people. And the most beautiful things happen when many people get together. So you were talking about different people taking the talent. Yes. And that's the part where we keep ourselves humble and we say, okay, I can't do everything. Exactly. I'm not best at everything, but there's so many other talented people out there that can contribute, exactly. that can be a part of and our you build movement. A team. And and you our build a team and everybody absolutely. has their, you know, everybody, when I, when I t- create my team around me, er, nobody's stepping on their, their the other person's toes because every person's story is unique to them and they have their own talent. So when I create my t- high, you know, high school tour, you know, I speak about the trade. I have a person with the disease. I have a music person that lives with sickle cell that, that plays, that sings and plays guitar. So we bring those together and now you have this movement and you're sharing your story and you're living and you're, you're thriving and, and you know, it's not about survival. And your your background is very important to me because how how my depression shifted was I took an education called Landmark Education mm-hmm. and they study, neuro, you know, the, the brain. And so I don't know how much time I have, but real quick, how, how, my, how my life sh- shifted was in that class, there was a story about the vicious circle mm-hmm. and having the reality of what happened and then the story that the mind creates and then collapsing those two worlds and now your story becomes your reality. And in that moment of that, my chair, when I looked in my life and discovered where did I make up a story about my life? Well, it was back in my career when I said my life was over. Correct. And when I f- saw that and discovered that, all they told me was that my career, my, I was pending a medical discharge. It didn't mean, I made it mean my life was over. Correct. And so when I bought all that, I bought all the negative off the shelf. Right. And when that ch- when I separated those two and saw the reality of what they said and the what I chose to make it mean, I can make it mean whatever I want. Exactly. So I replaced that negative conversation with my advocacy work. So now my life is not over. Actually, I've dedicated my life to this other cause called sickle cell trade awareness. This is incredible. And you're really depicting one of the topics I always talk about in my show is about really harnessing harnessing the energy that you have inside you and move from closing one chapter yeah. and opening another and that transitioning is very important and we know about veterans in general oh, there's major issues of transitioning of course. you know and and I've, i see it almost with every single one of the combat veterans i work with and even in on our world professionally that's one of the things we work on is always and and we do visual uh, one of the things i like to do is visualization with Mm -hmm. people and i have them look inside and see they see that one door closing but immediately as that door closing they need to see another open out the window they gotta (sighs) see that and they gotta walk through that door i want them to walk through that door because they need to see there's a whole new chapter to your life and and you look with respect and dignity about about the life that that you've just 
uh, uh, concluded yes. the type of experience you had and then you look with desire and excitement for that new chapter and it's ageless it is an ageless experience I absolutely do not want people to define that by their age by their no. condition by their cultural background no you are we are all age- ageless like in you said for veterans like myself it was the identity Correct. when when I got when I made my sergeant rank I was Sergeant Ferran Dozier, and I was proud. And then I became a staff sergeant. Then I became a sergeant first class. So even in civilian clothes, I introduced myself. I'm Sergeant First Class Ferran Dozier. Like, that was my identity. I was That was me. And when that was being taken away, well, now who am I? And okay. like you said, I had to, once I discovered that, it was, I know why God allowed me to serve all those years and, and be in those positions because that same mentality that I learned from the military, fighting for this country, I now can fight for this community and Absolutely. I have all the resources and knowledge to do that. Absolutely. We're all soldiers in different ways when we choose to do the right exactly. thing. Exactly. Uh, and, and just to conclude, and um, do we have a few minutes? Okay, okay. great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, this <laughs> it goes by so fast. It's been a great <laughs> hour and, and, and uh, you know, this so much more of this needs to be done. Uh, but but I do want to say about just that one more take home point for any of you listeners who have family members and particularly children and teenagers who are um, suffering from sickle cell trait or the, or the disease or even another condition yes. that they're going through. It doesn't have to be that, but it could be depression. It could be an, a different kind of issue. Please do focus on, in addition to everything else that you're doing, focus on giving them hobbies. Focus on giving them something that doesn't relate to the disorder. And yeah. I'm telling you that from experience is that when you're just focusing on treating the problem, but you're not giving something else, you're not giving a future, you're not giving something that the person can just purely enjoy, right. then you're not giving them something to look forward to. And they need to get occupied in something. They need to get occupied in something that they're proud of, not just occupation because it keeps them for two hours busy, but to give them something they connect to yes. emotionally. If it didn't work out with sports, try something else. Try yeah. music. If it didn't do music, do art. Experiment with your kid and see what's going to click because every brain is different and if something is going to click for your kid and that thing may actually save their life exactly and make their life the mental toughness a mental toughness is where you know i'm, I'm a like i said prevention uh, advocate for sickle cell trait but i understand that it, it's the mental state is is the first part and if you can get that mind right then you the body will, will, will get in line yep and not everybody's spiritual so that's why you know there's so many different life skills programs out there and so you have to you know some of us are born with the mental toughness but some of us you have to be taught that. And Correct. that's something you have to teach. Correct. And it's a topic of to. resilience. Yes. Um, well, this has been wonderful. I want to thank you so much for no, coming on you. the show today. This was phenomenal. <laughs> thank you. And we're going to fight. Oh, yes. We're going to keep fighting. This is just the start. This is just the start. And we're always going to continue and fight for the betterment of people. And, you know, we all have low days and low moments. So if your loved one is going through a hard time, you pick them up. They'll pick you up when you're feeling low. And you're going to pick them up when they feel mm-hmm. low. And, and that should listen. be the agreement. And, and for my sickle cell community, the, for the parents and the friends of people with sickle cell or, or, or patients, you got, you got to be able to listen to that person, pay attention to them because you will see the signs of the withdrawal and, and, and things like that. So just pay attention to what's going on around you and those people that you care about. Yeah. And just be there for them when they're going through that. It, it might take some time, you know, so people need the time to figure out, you know, the most important thing is not to dismiss someone's emotions, yes. not to just like say, okay, get over it or whatever. Um, or, or just be irritated near them. Just let them go through the process they have to go through. And that's the best way for them to reach where they need to reach. If you do have any more questions, um, where can you be reached? <laughs> um, I use my, my cell phone, 323-215-5384. And my website is wdconsct.org. And all my information is there about sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, sickle cell exertion. Um, uh, it's and if you want to reach out to me, if you're having a hard time finding the information or you want to um, uh, g- get in contact with uh, Ferron Dozier, please do email me drdgains at gmail.com. Find me on Facebook, The Dr. D Show. Please support us and support the causes that we are working yes, on. Thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show today. This was phenomenal. May you have a beautiful and wonderful week. Thank you. Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com.